the formation, the building, the making of uh, Israel as a nation. And uh, I'm going to do some gleaning. You know what gleaning means, right? Okay. Uh, no. no cleaning. No cleaning. It's cleaning. <laughs> uh, well, the reason why I say that because uh, there are some. No, that I don't think that you are knowledgeable. But sometimes some words that are not used all the time. People don't understand what the word is. And that's why I ask. So gleaning means you know, like you you go to a field and. Or trying to get those things that are the best. That's glean in the field, and uh, and that's what I'm doing uh, uh, with the story of Abraham. There's so much in here that I would be half a year trying to go through that. And I just give, I, will, I just want to give you some foundation so you know where all this is coming from, and that's all that I can do. Anything else that you want to do later? That's up to you, but at least some things will make sense later when any references make to Abraham and what we have to do with Abraham anyway. Prayer and we'll start the class. Gracious and heavenly father, we are thankful for your mercy. Uh, even today, thank yes, you for supplying needs. Thank you for providing protection. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the saints of God. The church thank you father for those things that you do that we don't see nor understand but uh, that you do uh, in protecting and guiding uh, your children thank you for those who are already uh, connecting and those who uh, may may want to connect later on be with them be with us help us to uh, to be uh, anointed in our minds to, so that we can understand the importance of some this some history that has to do with your people. We thank you for Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection, or his ascension, his uh, even today as he, Lord, uh, mediates between the church and you, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, guide us to pray. Amen. All right. Um, I go back to the word cleaning again. And uh, we're going to have to go to Genesis again. There's, there are some things that I'm passing over because I don't believe that they are uh, important to uh, the the reason for this class. Uh, there are some stories that are very very important in themselves, but they don't have to do uh, with the reason for these uh, lessons. Uh, we have the deliverance of Lot uh, by Abraham by Abraham. The Surprising revelation of Melchizedek that keeps being uh, an object of a lot of discussions among scholars who is Melchizedek, uh, who he was, and uh, especially because in the Libro of Hebrews, uh, he is brought up. So we are bypassing that. Not that it's important, I think it is, but uh, we cannot stop in everything that actually we see here. Uh, then uh, we come to, and I was asking my wife uh, tonight before the class, as we were sitting there and talking, uh, and I asked her, do you know that God made two covenants with Abraham? Because all the time you hear the covenant that God made with Abraham, the covenant, singular, but actually God made two covenants. Abraham, with Abram, and uh, I read it to her, and uh, and the, it is important because it shows number one, God's assurity, and also uh, God's sovereignty. Uh, the first covenant that God made with Abram uh, is found in Genesis 15, and we're not going to study it. 
we're just going to touch on it. Um, the Bible says in 51, and after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not. Um, this has to do with some of the things in the previous chapter. Number one, because a lot have been kidnapped. Uh, other nations did not trust Abram. And uh, there was a certain amount of danger. So God appears to Abram and tells him, fear not. It's just not like, if I would tell you fear not, just to encourage you. If there was a reason. He was surrounded by enemies. He was surrounded by strangers that necessarily did not speak his language. So you need to understand all these things to have a better comprehension. Uh, so God says to him, I am your shield and thy exceeding great reward. That to me is uh, awesome. He's not telling Abraham, I'm going to give you a great, a great reward. He's telling them, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. What is God saying? I am your reward. Me. The fact that you will be able to know me. The fact that we will have intimacy. The fact that we we will be able to be so close as we will see later in chapter 19 when God decides to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, God said, I cannot hide this from Abram. I cannot. So uh, these words, sometimes we skip over them so fast. And uh, it is a blessing to me how God told Abram, I am your exceeding reward. I am your reward. What a bigger reward can we have in our lives to know that God will be with you. That uh, you will have access to God. That nothing that happens to you will be uh, something that just happened because it happened. But there is a reason to your issues and your problems and uh, the things that you're facing in life, God has a purpose. That's your reward. That's a, that's a great promise. That definitely if Abraham or Abram uh, thought about later, it might have been a tremendous encouragement to this, uh, to this man. Um, then he says, and Abram, in verse 3, and Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be that heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. How many have had the privilege in your lifetime to actually be in a place where you can see practically most of the stars in heaven? Because we, we hardly see them here in Miami. I mean, you're in a city, you, you might see a few. But some of you raise your hand. It is a tremendous spectacle. Like, for example, when we used to go fishing at night in the middle of the ocean, when I was uh, in some places like uh, Panama in the jungles or in Mexico sometimes, uh, in places where there was no lights, and you could actually see stars in such a way that you couldn't even begin to count them. And this is what happened to Abraham. I said, look up. He said, that's, that's how your seed will be. That's how your descendants will be. 
you won't be able to count them. It's a tremendous promise. Uh, that some kind of a some kind of some some kind of a kind of a, uh, hard to believe because Abraham didn't have any children at that time. Uh, that was his uh, concerning the promise of God. All right, and the Bible says, verse six, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Okay, let's make a, 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 a recess right here. Let's stop right now. Please go with me to the book of Romans. Because the Apostle Paul uses this. Romans is beautiful, really. Tremendous. Romans chapter 4. And any of you, uh, feel free to read it. The first um, three verses. First verse. Chapter 4 of Romans, verses 1 through... I have, the, I have the New King James Version. Is that, is that okay? Or you want, you want the old? That's okay. That's fine. Yes. Okay, it says, um, what then, okay, what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? It's a question. For if Abraham was justified by work, right. Go ahead. For if Abraham was justified by works, he, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Go ahead. For what does the scripture say? Okay, but what the scripture say? Abraham believes okay, okay, God. Just a minute, just a minute. What the scripture say? So his okay. reference to, he's making reference, Paul is making reference to a scripture that is the one that we just read here in Genesis. It's the same. Okay, what does it say? That Abraham? Abraham believes God. And Mm -hmm. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. There you are. And that's what we read in Genesis uh, chapter 15. That it was uh, the fact that Abraham or Abraham believed God. God said, okay, give me your faith. You, you believe in me. You trust in me. So because you believe and you trust me, I will impute righteousness to you because many questions have been asked what about the people that in the old testament uh how were they saved well they were saved by faith and god used their faith to in exchange by god giving them righteousness because righteousness is one of the things that we must possess to be able to go to heaven and righteousness cannot go into heaven. God is a righteous God. But since man cannot produce righteousness, mm -hmm. the best of men, the best man on the earth uh, as a human is this. He can be a moral person. He can be a decent person. He can be a trusted individual. But he cannot produce righteousness. Righteousness comes from God as a gift. And Abram got this gift of righteousness because there was an exchange. Give me your faith and I will give you righteousness. Okay? So by that, Paul uses it later to uh, the people in Rome that some of them have, uh, some of them had doubts still about the fact that they had to keep some of the uh, some of the routine practice of the law, and uh, and this is what God was trying to uh, Paul was trying to prove that Abraham was made righteous without the works of the law, and we today in Christ Jesus 
we are not saved by the works that we do, but by faith in Christ. Now, there's an argument that can come with that. So that means that uh, God is not uh, looking at my works, that works are not important. That I'm, if I believe I'm saved, no, that's not what it means. What it means is that we have good works because we are saved. But we are not saved because we do good works. The good works are a fruit of our experience of salvation. But we cannot obtain salvation by doing good works. Because if that was so, then Jesus would have never died on the cross. And all that God would have said is, well, do good and you'll make it. But that's not the case. For all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. According to the book of uh, Romans 3.23, Romans 6 also deals with that thought. So here we have the wonderful blessing of Abraham by with whom God makes a covenant, okay? Uh, the Bible says, any, any, any question? Harley Ayala, can you come up? Can I see your face, please? There's Walter, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, just my phone is charging. Hold on. Oh yeah, okay. I'm here. It's just that, uh, yeah. Only the older ones can actually do that. The one. But this is a class. I don't want to see your face. I want to see your expression. Okay. I want to see your eyeballs. Okay. Um, God make covenant with this man called Abram. Okay. First covenant ever made. Really with a, a human being. And God is saying to this man, um, listen to what it says. Verse 15, and you shall go to your father in peace and will be buried in a good old age. He promised he, him that he's going to die a good death. Okay. The Bible says, verse 14, oh, I'm sorry. And he said unto Abraham, verse 13, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them for 400 years. So this is the question, what God is talking about here. What God is referring to here, Walter? The accident. Walter, do you have an idea what God is talking about? No, no. What, can you go? Can you go ahead and read the scripture again? This is for yeah. you to learn. We are learning. Okay, we are learning. Because these are things that you should know. Let's give you a chance, and then we we'll let somebody else. Right. Genesis chapter 15, 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that okay. I see. Know of a surety. That means for sure. For sure this is going to happen. What is going to happen? Go ahead. That thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that okay. is not theirs. Okay. What was he talking about? If you don't have an idea, you tell me that you don't have an idea, so I can give you one. Um, he's he's talking about their cho his children. Of course. But about what? That they that they won't feel like a stranger in their land, meaning like they're that's that land is theirs. No, 
So you're not reading the, the verse carefully. That's why we must read and meditate in what we're reading. And that's why so many Christians, and I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not making fun of you, uh, but I'm using this as an example uh, and excuse the words. If somebody says, uh, have said to me, you are to, you point out things too, too roughly, too, you know, in other words, you, <laughs> you don't go around the bush, you hit me straight. That's the way I am. That's the, I, that, that's the way I have always been. Because no, we won't get it. There's a lot of Christians that are totally and completely in kindergarten when they should have already graduated from high school, spiritually speaking. They know so little about Bible stories. Okay. And I guarantee you in today's generation, I guarantee it, more Christian young people in their teens, maybe in their 20s, know more about Star Wars. They know more about uh, all this fantasy, uh, movies that have been, they have made three or four sagas of them. There have been sagas made of them. Uh, Harry, Harry Potter and uh, I don't know how many movies about Batman and, and Spider-Man. They know more about all that than they know about the Old Testament stories. And that's a shame. Right. Yeah. Well, what he was make reference to, uh, for all of you to know, is that God was telling Abraham about what was going to happen to the people of Israel, that they would actually, in the future, in the coming future, they yeah. would be slaves in Egypt. Wow. And that they would be there for <laughs> 400 years. And after 400 years of yeah. being slaves in Egypt, God mm -hmm. was going to bring them out. He didn't say the name. Of course, by Moses. So he says you're going to be the father of a great nation, but they, your seed will go through a time in which there will be strangers in a land that is no theirs. That was Egypt. Okay. And shall serve them. And they shall afflict them for 400 years. Now, a lot of time went by. Years and years and years and generations came by and went by. Okay? And Abraham, Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob and the children of Israel had uh, uh, became, you know, the, the, the children of uh, Jacob became the children of Israel and because of Joseph and all all the things that happened later on, it went on, 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 on. And you would think that by then, God had for, forgotten. God never forgets. Because what God promised a thousand years ago is like if he had promised it last night. Okay? So after 400 years of slavery, God says, my clock says, it's time. So he said, Moses, and then you should know the Exodus and how they came out of Egypt after 400 years. Just like God said that was going to happen. Okay? So uh, that's the reason why I believe because we don't have a knowledge of all these things, how they're hooked together, you know, like a, like a chain. That some things in the Old Testament and in the Bible, they don't make sense because you don't understand. So these stories, it's just not stories. They are there for you to, it's for you to actually uh, see God's plan. How God built all this one step after another step, one brick after another brick, so forth and so on, until it was fulfilled according to his plan until Jesus is born. 
But we read the Old Testament, and the Old Testament brings us to what? It brings us to Jesus Christ. But if not, if you begin to ask questions, and those questions you ask yourself, there are a lot of things that don't make any sense. Or you don't understand why they are there. Why? What is the reason of this? Then you have to go through the, the conquering in, in Canaan, the judges, and then you have to go through all the prophets. And then you have to go through 70 years of uh, 70 years of captivity in Babylon and so forth and so on. And then the Jews go back again. So once you have every piece in its place, it's a beautiful picture. And God's patience and long suffering to bring about this glorious plan of salvation. And that's the reason why in the book of Galatians, Paul says, in its due time, Jesus came. So Jesus is no born in 33 AD. I'm just giving you a date, not necessarily true, but to give you an idea of how dates work uh, since Jesus was born. And uh, Jesus is not born because, uh, uh, well, he, he was born in that time because it just happened. No, it was not. Everything was designed. Everything came in the right time. And there was a reason for his coming when he, when he came. Not 50 years before, not 50 years later. It was the right time. So you see everything that God put into this. And that's why we must appreciate it's more than Jesus dying on the cross. It's everything that God worked out. All oh, the patience of God with the people. The patience of God with those people in the wilderness. The patience of God when they went into 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 Canaan and how they did not obey and they did things have done because they never actually uh, conquered everything in Canaan. They left only, uh, they only conquered the easy nations, some of the nations that were on the, on the hills, they never went up there to conquer. And Jesus came. Do you remember? How many of you remember some of uh, people that were not Jews, the Pharisean uh, woman and others that came to Jesus for a miracle for the daughter, for the son, so forth and so on. These people, do you know why they were there? They were survivors because they were not exterminated by the judges. These people should have been gone a long time ago. But they were not conquered. And what they did is they actually held them like captives and made him pay taxes instead of getting rid of them. And that's the mess. All right. Let me, let me keep going. Any question? Kind of boring, isn't it? Not at all, not at all, brother. Okay. <laughs> it is 15. So God makes um, in verse 18, chapter 15, 15, 18, listen to this. In the same day, the Lord made, 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 no will make, but made, Covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. Did he say, I will give you the land? What did he say? I have given. What does that mean? It means that it's already declared that he has already done it so it, it was theirs right yeah okay all right um then he says i give in this land from the river of egypt 
unto the great river Euphrates. So from Egypt to Babylon, from Egypt to Persia, from Egypt to Iraq, all that land. God has given it to the people of Israel. It is yours. Did they take seriously the promise? They did not take it seriously. They did not take it seriously. Okay. So the Bible says the Kenites, the Kenesites, and the Kadmonites, and the Hittites, I was going to say, and the parasites, but that's not the parasites. The parasites and the refines and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgasites and the Jebusites were in the land. All these were nations. I found out uh, because sometimes we get concepts and they are so wrong. And by having these ideas and we, we are so lazy that we don't want to find out. Uh, but I found out that this, 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 this people that we're talking about, they were kingdoms. They were no Indian tribes like. These people had cities. They had kings. They had a culture. They had cultures. So it was a big job to actually go into that land and fight all these nations and overcome them. And they did as long as they follow God's orders. Because with God, everything is possible and we're going to see that again. So now we come to chapter uh, 16. Where Sarai, Abram's wife, could not have any children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian that he picked up when he went to Egypt, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. It was the custom of those nations that if, if they had maids, they could have children with them. And at the moment of giving birth, uh, the, the, the real wife would be there and that they would receive the child. They would claim the child as theirs. So that was, that's what happened. Go to, our, to my maid, Agar, have a child because she got impatient. And we know that that was trouble in the beginning. Every time we do things outside God's will, it's trouble. Okay? And those trouble can follow you for the rest of your life. And the Bible uh, declares that that's what happened. But uh, see, uh, Hagar, Hagar did not realize that she was a tool to bring the child. He claimed that child as hers, and Sarai began to have uh, jealousy sentiments, she became jealous. And um, in fact, Hagar went as far as making fun of Sarai because she couldn't have any children. And the story goes that Sarai gets very upset and as the, as the, ten, as the, as the time went on, then we find that God appears to Abram again in chapter 17. Okay? And I know that I'm making jumps, and I told you I would. So the Bible says, verse 17, I mean, sorry, chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine he was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God. 
Walk before me and be thou what? Be perfect. what? Blameless. Perfect. Perfect or blameless, okay. So. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, when you say the, um, the, the almighty God appeared, was it actually like, he actually saw God? Like, what do you mean by no, that? No, nobody has seen that. Or was it like a, in, in a voice? Like a voice. Okay. That mm, like a voice. The reason why I say that is because the Bible, so the Bible says that no man can see God and live. Okay. Right. right. If you cannot see the sun for five minutes with your eyes open because the sun rays will cook your eyeballs, how can you see the creator of the sun? Yeah. So that's intense. Uh, well, you know, when Paul was uh, on Saul of Tarsus, the Bible says that he saw uh, a bright light, like the midday light, and he was blinded. For five days, he couldn't see. So uh, the Bible says that he was 99 years old. Brother Alex, God, yes. Do we know, um, like, the gap between when he when God appeared to him there because it says that he was 90 years old how old was he since the last time God spoke to him or when he made the covenant do we oh, is there like a time years, frame about 10 years approximately like 10 years okay no, I was yeah. just wondering yeah see Abraham didn't have a book he didn't have a Bible but we have one so when you begin to to write down the, the, the times in which God appears to Abram. There were not that many times. And here is what Abram grows before me as a man of God. He had only a few appearances, but he believed everything God said. He never forgot it. He never did. And uh, in, in fact, I'm, I'm going to make a big jump here and then I'll hurry back. There was a time in which God told Abraham in chapter 22, we're not going to reach there because it is not something that uh, I would like to because this is a tremendous lesson. I, I have preached on it. But God appeared to, a to Abraham already when Abraham already had a son called Isaac, right? And the, the, the name Isaac means laughter. And the reason why he was named laughter was because when Sarah heard that she was going to have a child, she laughed. And God said to, to, to Abraham, why is she laughing? She doesn't know that with me, everything is possible. But anyway, there was a moment in which God says to Abraham, take your only son, Isaac, the one that you love, and take him to Moriah, the hill of Moriah, and offer to him in sacrifice to me. And the Bible says there was no argument from Abraham. You gave me and now you are taking it. Which is a tremendous lesson to us too. God giveth and God what? Taketh away. Right? Do we have a right to claim anything? When God takes it? Because you got it because he gave it to you, right? Well, it's hard I, can, I can't see anymore. Why do you took my eyesight? You're a mean God. Why do you take it? Who gave you the eyesight? Those eyes are mine. Come on. Whatever is taken is because God gave it. And he has a right. Somebody, but that's not fair. But who are you that are a vessel to tell the potter that made the vessel, why do you make me this way? Okay. And that's one of the things that a lot of people have today because a problem with because the vessels are complaining to the potter. Why is this and why that and why the other? 
I'm mad at you and you're not, you don't even exist. Well, why do you exist? Who made you? <laughs> Where you come from? From nothing, really nothing creates nothing. That's another argument. Nothing cannot create anything. Are you gonna tell me that for billions and billions of years of nothing, all of a sudden nothing had an explosion? Nothing, you can't have an explosion because you are nothing. You have to be a fool, stupid. Yeah, because that's what the scientists that... are trying to tell us today. You know, all of a sudden there was an explosion, but tell me there was nothing. No, because the gases, what gases? There was nothing. There were no gases, there was no, nothing, 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 nothing. And there's something because there's air, but not even air. So you're gonna tell me that for trillions and three, or I don't know, for whatever years you wanna mention, there was nothing and all of a sudden there was an explosion of nothing. It's, it takes a lot of faith to be an atheist, you know? Yes. I don't have that kind of faith. To be an atheist, to be an agnostic, you know how much faith you have to have? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like getting a, a watch and just separate it. Well, this, uh, you know, a battery watch says this. Uh, I was going to call it Mickey Mouse watches, but now somebody gave me this, this watch. And back in the old days when you had to rewind them, you know, they had all those little things, grinding things there. <laughs> and you'd separate all the buttons and all the gear, the, the gears inside and all that kind of stuff, and the glass and the, the hands and the, all the kind of stuff, and put them in, in a, in a, in a, in a bag, okay, in a bag. And what are the possibilities that you will bring out each one in perfect order? How can you do that? Not okay. <laughs> now, I can see going through, going through um, a wilderness or a desert and I'm finding a, uh, I'm finding a, a watch band. Oh, look at this. What is this? I wonder. What would we call it? Oh, we're going to call it a watch band. So farther down, maybe a mile or so, hey, you find a, a little hand. And uh, so forth and so on. You get all these parts, okay? And you say, look at that, what we have found. Now, if I find a watch complete and perfect on the ground, it talks to you about what one thing intelligence. Okay. So I don't know why I got into this. Let me go backtrack. I am the Almighty. I'm going to make uh, a covenant with you. And your name, oh, verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be a father of many nations. My covenant is with you. It's not a covenant between you and me or anything is between me and you. Okay. And your name shall be no more Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made you. And I will make you exceeding fruitful and I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee 
and thy seed after you in the generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of mm. nations for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant before thou and thy seed after thee in the generations. And this is the covenant Verse 10, you will circumcise every man child. Circumcision was the sign of this covenant. Every man child to be circumcised. A lot of lessons on that. And I have preached on it. God has the right to get into the most intimate parts of your life. Circumcision was established as a covenant between the people of Israel and God. You understand that? Every Jew had to be circumcised. And um, let me ask you a question because I like to ask questions because maybe you don't ask enough questions. Maybe you accept things without asking. What happened to the people that died in the wilderness? That were born in the wilderness. They were born in the wilderness when they were traveling to Canaan. And they were born there because the rest died. The rest died that were 20 years and uh, and over. You know what happened? Before they entered into Canaan, God told Joshua, you're going to have to circumcise every male because there was no circumcision in the wilderness. You ever thought about that? Never thought about it? Oh. I've never read the word of God enough to oh. get some understanding about this. All this is very important mm. because this is the plan of salvation in types and shadows. Paul speaks about the circumcision of heart. And I'm going to make a big jump over here and I, uh, I don't want to say it, but I will anyhow. Sometimes, you know, I don't want to say things, but I say it. I'm not saying that you don't know, but I will be surprised if half of you know that the only people that were able to be circumcised had to be Jews, right? Number two, if you were yes. a Jew, then later on you had to be circumcised. All deals with that. We are born again, listen now, we are born again, and then we have to be spiritually circumcised. And that's what the Bible speaks about being sanctified. Because circumcision is not something that is necessary to procreation. Okay? It's unnecessary. Why did God do it? To show that he was established, establishing covenant with the people of Israel. And then after that happens, the Bible goes back to Abraham and God says, you will not call Sarai thy wife anymore by that name. In verse 15, from now on, her name will be Sarah. And verse 16 in chapter 17 says, and I will bless her and give thee a son after her. Oh boy, this was something 
for Sarah. It was something for Sarah. It was almost what? When she heard it, she laughed. She think it was a big joke. And then we're making a big jump here and we're gonna leave it here. In, in, in chapter 18, are you following me? Yes. See, so that's a lot of things to keep in mind. Well, that's a lot of things when you wanna be smart, you want to be knowledgeable of Bible, when you want, you have to study the word of God. It's not about reading, it's about studying. This is the most important subject of your life. There is no a subject in high school or college that's more important than knowing your Bible. In fact, I'm going to go as far as to say that if you read your Bible, listen to what I'm going to say. And I know that if somebody hears me that uh, uh, that has a, how you call this, uh, um, a predisposition to criticize, that you are crazy, you don't know what you're talking about. If you read the Bible and that's all you had, okay, you will know as much as a person that goes to college. Just by reading the book of uh, Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. And then you follow everything that the Bible uh, shows that God told Moses about the law and cleanliness and sowing and planting, you will be so knowledgeable in agriculture, in ethics, in cleanliness. And when God dealt with circumcision, you know that every child was circumcised the eighth day. And according to science, of course, today they have other methods, but according to science, the Least, the less circulation on a male child is on the eighth day. And that's why God says circumcise him that day. Not the ninth day, not the fifth day, the eighth day. Because God knows all about you. Your circulation, your insides, your nervous system. Yeah. Any, any comments? You don't make comments, you don't. No? We're listening. <laughs> Who? We are listening. Oh, we are listening. We're eating. <laughs> well, I want to be sure that this is just not a, something that I'm just telling you because I don't have nothing else to tell. When we finish with this, we're gonna get some practical series. Brother, but this is so brother, important. I, yes. You never mentioned it. We said it when people died in the wilderness, you didn't say why. Okay. Uh, the reason why God, I'm going to use the rough one because I don't want to say let them die. The reason why God killed them all in the wilderness in 40 years. Made him go around and around and around and around. They were getting nowhere. They could get, listen to this, they could have gotten from Egypt to Canaan in about 40 days. You see that something? 40 days. And it took the people of Israel 40 years. Now, why? Because they rebel against God so many times that when actually they reach the river of Jordan, they start fussing and carrying on and unbelief. And uh, they had sent spies to look over the land and they saw, they said, we saw giants. And we look like a little, little worms before them. And they began to give uh, Joshua a, a big problem and Moses and, and God said, because you are, uh, because of your unbelief, you would not go in. So God had him 40 years going around and around and around until all that generation died. And when all the generation died 20 up, then of course they have had a lot of children in the, in the wilderness. They went in. 
but they have to be circumcised according to the word of God. You see that in Joshua chapter. Okay, so that's it. We leave it there and we'll continue next, uh, next class. And I believe with two more, we will come to an end about the formation because I want to deal with uh, how the 12 tribes came to be and how the nation of Israel was actually formed and the reason why uh, God chose Israel as a nation. That's very important. So you can understand why Jesus was born in, the, in Palestine and not in China. He was not born in Jamaica or he was not a Cuban or a Mexican. <laughs> Imagine Jesus eating tacos. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he would have loved them. I'm sure he would have loved tacos. Yes, I sure. And Jesus would say, "Amen." <laughs> well, Why you imagine if he was. You imagine if he would have been Cuban. Why they didn't make Noberia over here this time? Okay, we'll come oh, to man. an end. Uh, if you have any questions, I will accept one. I had kind of like I just wanted to know. If it was just something I was thinking or I had seen it the way I saw it, maybe I was whatever, wrong. Whatever. But I mean, I didn't want to keep the class. I was just going to ask you after. But, um, okay. but... ask. Okay. Maybe some will learn something. Well, when I was, I'm going back to when you were talking about in ch chapter 15 and you were saying how. God had said, fear not, Abraham, I am the sh thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. And it does sound, you know, obviously I believe it and I know um, it's something that is true. But I I was seeing the next verse and how Abraham said, Lord, God, what will thou give me seeing I go childless? And in a way, I kind of was seeing, you know, Abram's humanity in a way because God is telling him I am enough and many times yes we do believe that God is enough and we know he is enough but sometimes you know you still want those things that are like children or you know like a career mm -hmm. or even a spouse and to me it just it spoke to me a lot about it was just a comment it wasn't a question really but and I wanted to see if it kind of was in the same thought process or not but it spoke to me how you see that, you know, Abraham is still saying, you know, I know you're enough, but I still kind of want these things. Like he wanted a child, he wanted an heir. And it shows you how God didn't take it as like, oh, why don't you think I'm enough? You know, it kind of shows you that he ended up telling yeah. him that you would be the father of, you know, of nations of, you know, of your, your seed would be, would grow. And I don't know. I thought it was kind of it was a it was a good thing to see it. It was just to see that God does that. But I wasn't sure if it was maybe correct or not. But that's just kind of what I had seen. No, it is <laughs> it, it is a very very good observation. Uh, yeah. And, and God didn't yes. say to him, you know, I I am enough for you. He didn't say that. But but God says, you know, I am your reward. But right. uh, that reward did not cover every aspect of uh, Abraham's life because God already was telling him you, you're gonna have you're gonna have uh, a seed right so uh, of course that there are things uh, that uh, that we desire and 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 we and we need sometimes right. and I don't think there's nothing wrong uh, it does not mark you as a, a non-spiritual being. That's what I was saying. A, a lot of Christian people have this thing that everything is spiritual and right. everything has to, yeah, no, not necessarily. That's not the way it is. Right. Uh, we we have needs. We are not angels. We 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 have things in our lives that are part of our, 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 of our life. In fact, uh, you read through the book of... Uh, Ecclesiastes and all the books where he says it's not good for a man to be alone. So, right, and course, that's 
that's what I had seen because, you know, Abraham is called the father of faith, I believe, or something like that, if I'm not yes. mistaken. And, you know, it's kind of intimidating in a way you would think, oh, he's so spiritual or he's so, you know, but it shows you, at least it showed me that he was also very much indeed human, even though we know he was human, but it shows you he still wanted that. And I don't know, I thought it was a beautiful thing and I wanted to share it and I wanted it to is. see if I was right. <laughs> You're right, and uh, furthermore, uh, we need to remember that he's our father. And uh, even though there's a certain amount of uh, godly fear in, the, in respect to uh, our parents, especially the ones who have done the right thing, uh, God wants you, to, uh, wants you to come to him as your, your heavenly father. He taught us. You're, you are my father. So, and he says then uh, to come boldly, not with fear, before the throne of grace and make known to God. That's why I have said many times in this class, when you pray, don't be cute. Don't play the spiritual card. You know, don't try to be what you are not. Are you afraid? Tell him. Are you upset at him? Tell him. Uh, you don't understand, tell him. Just talk to God. Don't go into this thing, oh, you gracious heavenly father, the utmost holy God who is in heaven, and you put him out so far away that you know he cannot be reached. And he says, I'm right here. I am within, within your reach. He's your spiritual daddy. Okay, so we come to a close. Um, anyone want to? Ivy wanted to say something, brother. Yes. Mr. Ivy, she had her hand up. Oh, I just, um, I just wanted to say that I appreciate God for that scripture. Um, God actually gave me that particular scripture at one point um, when I was going through a lot. To, and I appreciate God for it because what it, what it told me was that it's okay to be happy in the Lord and to still want something yes. or have yes. strive for something um, yes. to feel not satisfied in the sense that I'm not exactly where I want to be. And I, it, it's so personal that God would acknowledge that we might feel unsatisfied with certain things. And so um, that scripture has actually been a real blessing to me. Um, and so I just wanted to share that. So yes, it, it, it's a blessing. To and he says, ask and it shall be given to you. Knock, and it shall be open to you. So why would you knock? Because I need. Why would I ask? Because I need. Why would I call? Because I need. So God knows. He remembers that we are dust. He remembers, says in his word. That's it. So let's have let's have a moment of prayer then and go ahead, uh, sit there, Ivy, and let's make you some prayer. Dear God, as we come before you, we thank you so much for your goodness and love, your mercy. We thank you for these classes, dear God, that have been so personal, Lord, and have helped us to see you in so many different ways, dear God, and how you love us and how you laid out the plan of salvation, Lord, how you are willing to, uh, the promises that you've made, they're true no matter when you've made them, dear God, and Amen. we appreciate the encouragement that you give, Lord, the truth of your word, Lord. Lord, you, you said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And it's so good to know that you give rest even as Amen. we're saved, dear God, Thank that you, there Lord. are things we don't have to carry Amen. alone, Lord, but that you give us rest, Lord. And we, we're so thankful, Lord. We love you. We appreciate you you we ask that you would help us lord help us to apply these things to our hearts help us not to let them slip help us to meditate and to chew on them dear god lord we want to get the most out of what you're trying to tell us lord we don't want to miss the messages that you're saying to us dear god lord so we ask that you would help us to be honest and open that we would apply your word dear god 
We thank you so much for Brother Alex and Sister Carol, Lord, and for their burden for us, dear God. We appreciate the love, the care, dear God. Lord, we ask that you would bless the rest of this, um, the rest of this week, dear Lord. Show mercy and help us, Lord, to be who you're calling on us to Amen. be. Amen. In Jesus' name, Amen. we thank you and we love you. Amen.